headset. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Then I apologize that this might, the sound quality may not be like super great uh, since I'm not talking right into my microphone. But uh, the good news is you all didn't hear my dogs going crazy a couple minutes ago when I said my dogs were barking. So uh, that's excellent. Um, so thank you everyone. And I will start over. Uh, thank you for your understanding last week of me needing to uh, call, cancel our meeting at kind of the last minute. Uh, like I said, I, I have a new job, which is great, uh, but sometimes, you know, with a new job, you end up getting stuck at work uh, a little bit later than you intended. So I will have those slides recorded for you, hopefully this weekend, and we'll get those uploaded. But you do have the notes PDF available on the website in the members only area where the beer judge training resources are. Uh, so you definitely have access to those slides to read over them and get familiar with those styles. But I will make sure to record those and get that uploaded and available to you. So tonight we're going to be talking about, let me get it pulled up here. Um, I totally remember. <laughs> we're going to be talking about dark British beer, American Porter and Stout, and Amber and Brown American beer. So I'm going to get my screen shared here. And like uh, we'll do what we always do, where I will, uh, we have three different categories to talk through tonight. And I'll take a brief break uh, between each one of the categories. So as you have questions, feel free to put them in the QA. And uh, when we get to that kind of natural breaking point between the beer styles, I can take a couple of minutes and answer any questions that you have. So let's get started. Tonight, we're going to be talking a lot about stouts and a lot about a different, a bunch of different kinds of stouts uh, with a few other beer styles thrown in for good measure. So uh, I think dark British beer is always kind of a strange title for this category. I get it. I get why. Uh, but I know I, I'd had somebody reach out about an oatmeal stout and where would I find that in the guidelines? And like your first thought wouldn't be dark British beer. But within the dark British beer category, we have sweet stout, oatmeal stout, tropical stout, and foreign extra stout. Then with the American porter and stout category, we have American porter, we have American stout, and we have imperial stout. And then we'll finish up with amber and brown American beer. And within that category, we'll talk about American amber ale, California common, and American brown ale. So as always, I have our score sheets on there, on here. I know a few of you were able to judge or steward this weekend if you were in or around Atlanta at the Can Can Awards and you saw a completely different kind of score sheet. Um, that is an older score sheet. It's great to get exposure to how uh, score sheets change over the years, but that score sheet, uh, I won't spend too much time on it, understanding that not everybody who's watching this was there, but that score sheet is about 12 years old. Uh, so just know that for most competitions, when you go in, you will see that competition score sheet that's on the left part of your screen. And for the exam, when you go in to take your BJCP beer judging exam, you will see that exam score sheet on the right side of the screen. Those are very standard. Uh, so I always like to include them. So it's not a surprise if you go into the beer judging exam and you see this exam score sheet that doesn't have any of the descriptors on there. So with dark British beer, these are going to be most of our stouts. And when I record the week nine slides, we'll talk there about Irish stout and Irish extra stout. But these are going to be strong to average to strong, bitter to sweet, modern British and Irish stouts. So stout really originated in England, but some of these styles are now more widely associated with Ireland. And British in this sense means the broader British Isles and not just or not only Great Britain. So I've been including this in our the last couple of weeks of our weekly email that uh, most of you should be getting. If not, check your junk folder. But the terminology, uh, I have to refer to this often because I never remember, you know, what's England, what's Great Britain, what's the United Kingdom. Uh, so I like to include this. So when we're talking about the British Isles, this is what we're talking about and how each one of these kind of falls 
into uh, the different ge or different geographical areas. So starting with sweet stout, this is a very dark, sweet, full-bodied, slightly roasted ale that can suggest coffee and cream or sweetened espresso. It's going to be a fairly low ABV. It'll be about mid-range. And we'll talk about this also, uh, or I guess visit it when I get the, the slides recorded for the Irish stout and Irish extra stout. But a lot of times we associate the strength of a beer with its color. And stouts, a lot of the stouts we'll talk about tonight, when we go back through the Irish stout, this like sweet stout is a really great example of, you can have a very full bodied beer with still having fairly low ABV. So I know when, you know, when I first started drinking beer and I would drink a Guinness, people would say, oh, that looks like motor oil. I don't know how you can drink that. And it's actually very light bodied. Uh, so the moral of this story is that you can have a very dark beer it can have a fairly full body, but still be low ABV. So the thing that makes a sweet stout, the uh, sweet, you may also sometimes see it as a milk stout, is through the addition of lactose, which is a milk sugar. And lactose is unfermentable by the yeast, which means that it's going to stick around throughout fermentation. It's going to give you that sweet flavor. That's a lot of like milkshake IPAs, uh, ha some hazy IPAs. It's not necessarily standard for a hazy IPA, but if you see something that says milkshake IPA, that indicates or typically indicates that they've added lactose to it. So it's a milk sugar. And that's what is in sweet stout that makes it sweet. So our aroma. Mild roasted grain, sometimes with coffee and or chocolate. So this is going to definitely be a stout flavor, but it's not going to be an imperial stout. And I will probably say this a few times throughout our session tonight that getting commercial examples of each one of these stouts and tasting them side by side is a really, really great sensory experience to really understand what the difference is between a sweet stout, an oatmeal stout, a tropical stout, for an extra stout, throw in an Irish stout, throw in an Irish extra stout. You've got a lineup of beers that are fantastic for training your palate because they're all going to be basically the same color and they're going to have a lot of the very same flavors, but there's going to be some variations in each one. And sweet stout is definitely one of those that it's uh, it used to be called an invalid stout or a mother stout because it was thought to be good for mothers who are breastfeeding. It was uh, made weaker and sweeter for people who were sick, who were bedridden. Uh, so hops, for most of the stouts we're going to talk about tonight, the hops are going to be none to very low because this is a malt forward beer. So the, the hops will be there to help balance some of that roastiness. So it's not overly roasty or in the cases of sweet stout, overly sweet. They'll be there to provide bitterness, but that's really the only role that they're playing when it comes to stouts. Uh, so if you get any kind of hop flavor, it's going to be floral or earthy. With the fermentation characteristics for most of the stouts we'll talk about tonight, you may have some fruitiness, so low to moderately high. And this is another one of those styles where if you get a low level of diacetyl, it's going to be acceptable. Again, like we've said before, if you are detecting a level of diacetyl and it's making you wonder, um, is this too much diacetyl? Uh, it probably is. So remember that diacetyl none to low, it can be low because of our yeast strain that we're going to use. It's going to attain or flocculate very well, which means it's going to pull a lot of the yeast out of suspension fairly early, uh, which means that that diacetyl may not get cleaned up. And definitely, if you weren't able to watch the little short lesson I did on diastole a few weeks ago, um, if you're wondering or wanting to learn more about how that's caused uh, and what you can do to fix that, go check that out. I think we did that in maybe week six. Uh, but diacetyl in most of these stouts at very low levels is going to be acceptable. So with the sweet stout, it's going to be that cream-like sweetness is what's going to give it away that you're drinking a sweet stout. Uh, so color, very dark brown to black. It can be opaque. If it's not opaque, it should be clear. And I know we've discussed this before about the um, opacity of a beer. If it's very dark, how do you, 
how do you assess its clarity? Generally, uh, you'll be able to get an idea, you know, think about something like a New England IPA, right? That's very hazy, that has a lot of solids and suspension. Um, even when you have a darker beer, if that's the case, you'll be able to see that in the beer. Uh, one thing that I like to do with a really dark beer, if I'm trying to get an idea of the clarity, is just tilt it and look down at the, you know, tilt the glass a little bit so the beer is at an angle and kind of look at the edge of that beer where the beer is going to meet the glass to see how clear that looks. Uh, generally, though, with most stouts, we're going to expect them to be dark enough that they're actually opaque. Uh, the head color is going to be tan to brown and the texture is going to be creamy. And one other thing that I will say about sweet stouts is this is also often where you see oyster stouts fall into this category. Those are typically sweet stouts. Um, an Irish extra stout, Irish stout may also sometimes be called an oyster stout. Uh, they're called that because they pair well with oysters. Uh, the issue is that a lot of people have heard oyster stout and so they add oyster set shells, or I've even seen sometimes like actual oysters or oyster brine added to an oyster stout. Technically that's incorrect. Uh, it's called an oyster stout because it pairs well with oysters, not because it's supposed to have oysters actually in it. But generally when you see an oyster stout, it will be a sweet stout. So with our flavors, it's going to be very similar to the aroma, dark roasted grain or dark roasted malt impression. Coffee and chocolate flavors dominate the palate. And as we talk through some of these stouts tonight, we'll get into those nuances of coffee and chocolate. Uh, generally, in the sense of something like a sweet stout, you're not expecting like a very roasted, very hard, harsh, dark roast coffee. The same way you're not expecting a very dark, you know, like almost like cacao chocolate. Uh, these are going to be a little bit backed off from that. Our bitterness is going to be moderate. Again, it's there really to balance that roastiness and the malt flavor. And if we have any hop character, that's going to be low floral to earthy. So those really traditional English kinds of hops are going to be the floral to earthy if you're able to pick up that flavor at all. So fermentation characteristics, diacetyl, none to low moderate to low fruity esters. And those fruity esters, depending on the style, are going to come across usually a little bit more of a darker fruit ester. So something like a plum or a prune, a raisin, sometimes fig, um, with something like a sweet stout, you don't normally get those kinds of like that sort of almost like chewy fruity ester, but you would get something like prunes, raisins, uh, and then other flavor characteristics, so that medium to high sweetness from the lactose that was added to it provides a counterpoint to the roasted character and the hot bitterness. Our body is going to be medium full to full, carbonation low to moderate, and will also that high residual sweetness, again, from the lactose, from the unfermented sugar, which is when you're lactose, uh, that's going to enhance that full mouthfeel. So again, this is actually a fairly lighter bodied stout that the addition of those unfermentable sugars is going to contribute to having a fuller body. So the next we have oatmeal stout. Oatmeal stout is a very dark, full body, roasty, malty ale with a complimentary that should be a complimentary oat flavor. So I will fix that. Uh, again, when we're talking about an oatmeal stout, a true oatmeal stout, uh, which if for, you know, for purposes of this conversation is going to be a stout with oatmeal added, when you get to more like adjunct stouts with a lot of stuff in there, um, you know, you can, you can call a beer style anything you'd like, right? So with the oatmeal stout, in this case, we're looking at that mid ABV range kind of stout, like more of a drinkable stout, not so much a big, you know, a big hearty imperial stout. So with an oatmeal stout, we're going to have that mild roasted grain, similar to how we have what we have in every stout, uh, generally a coffee and cream impression. And then the addition of the oats or the oatmeal should give you that light grainy oatmeal nutty flavor. Uh, that's really going to be kind of your tip off that you've got an oatmeal stout as opposed to other, uh, other forms of stouts. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the flavor. 
and the mouthfeel. Again, with our hops, if you get any hops, it should be medium low and they're going to be earthal, earthy or floral. I must have earthal and flory. Uh, so it's been a day. Again, low to medium fruitiness and diacetyl can be low to none. Our color is going to be medium brown to black. It should be opaque. We're going to have a persistent tan to brown, thick and creamy head. And those oats that are added are going to be what's contributing to that thick and creamy head. So the flavor, mild roasted coffee to coffee and cream flavors. The oats should add a nutty, grainy, or earthy flavor. And this is an important point with something like an oatmeal stout. If the beer is an oatmeal stout, if you're sitting down to um, judge it in competition, uh, fill out a score sheet in your tasting exam, and you're told this is an oatmeal stout, you should be able to taste the oats in the beer. Uh, it doesn't have to be super strong, but they should be there. You should be able to detect them. The bitterness is going to be medium. Again, our hops, medium, low, earthy, or floral, if they're there at all. Or I, I should say, it's more correct to say they can be up to a medium low. So if you have you know, a low floral hop flavor, that's not going to be a, a fault or anything like that. It can be up to medium low, which is a very strange range to say. <laughs> and then with our fermentation characteristics, low to moderately high fruitiness, diacetyl, medium low to none. It's, this is going to be malt balance. All of the stouts we're talking about tonight are going to be malt balance. I believe actually most of the styles we're talking about are going to be very malt forward, um, which will be a nice respite because I think next week is when we're going to start getting into all of the IPAs and then it'll be a couple of weeks of just hop forward. And uh, the finish is going to be medium sweet to medium dry. The mouthfeel, medium full to full. Those oats that are being added to the stout are going to give us that very creamy impression. Uh, it's also going to be very silky, a very full mouthfeel. Sometimes, so the note is in here that sometimes you can get an oily slickness from the oatmeal. Um, not always, but sometimes it can be there. And I found sometimes with oatmeal stouts, for me, what can tell me that there are oats in the beer, if I can't quite taste it, or I'm wondering maybe if that's, if that is what I'm tasting, the mouthfeel will usually give it away because it will have this very full creamy mouthfeel. Think about a bowl of oatmeal, right? And how creamy that is, how viscous that is. The oats are going to add that same kind of character to the oatmeal stout. So with a tropical stout, tropical stout is one of my favorite styles because um, it's, delicious, but you also don't see it very often. So it's always kind of a treat uh, whenever I can find a good tropical stout somewhere. So this is going to be a very dark, sweet, fruity, moderately strong ale with smooth, roasty flavors without a burnt harshness. Uh, so when we're talking about a, a tropical stout, we're starting to get a little bit up in ABV. So this can be anywhere from a very sessionable 5.5% up to 8%. And it's called a tropical stout because it developed in places like Jamaica, uh, Jamaica Stout, Dragon Stout, ABC Extra Stout, those are all Jamaican beers. And the there, uh, it can be kind of counterintuitive, like you wouldn't immediately think something very roasty uh, would be that refreshing in a tropical climate, but the, you know, that fruitiness, the sweetness, uh, really helps kind of balance that roastiness. And it is, it is pretty refreshing, uh, which is one of the reasons why I like tropical stouts so much. So for the aroma, our grain, or pardon me, the malt is going to be roasted, moderate to high, dark grain, right? So when we're talking roasted, that's when we're getting those coffee, those chocolate notes. Uh, with something like a tropical stout, it may also have a molasses, licorice, dried fruit, or vinous kind of character to it because we're going to have a little bit of like caramel malts in there. Um, so it's not going to be just straight roasted malt. That's where we're starting to get a little bit more of kind of that sweetness, that chewiness, and also that fruitiness. Hops are going to be, if they're there, low, earthy to floral or earthy or floral. Uh, fruitiness is going to be medium to high. So with a tropical stout, usually that higher fruitiness is going to be what's going to give it away as a tropical stout as opposed to a sweet stout or an oatmeal stout and diacetyl low to none. 
with our appearance, very deep brown to black. It should be opaque. If it's not opaque, it should be clear. Good head retention, tan to brown head color. Again, this is why this makes doing a lineup of all, of all the different kinds of stouts. Um, it can be intimidating, but trust me when I tell you that it's a very good way to learn the differences between each one of them because they really are fairly, not entirely, but fairly distinct. And if you, uh, you know, it's a good opportunity to tease out those differences between all of them. So with the flavor, the malt is going to be quite sweet. We're going to have smooth, dark green flavors, moderate to high coffee or chocolate. And again, when we get to like the Imperial Stout and even the Foreign Extra Stout, those are going to have a little bit more of the acridity from, you know, from darker, darker roasted grains. At this point with like something like a Tropical Stout, it shouldn't be harsh, it shouldn't be burnt. Um, it should just be a high coffee or chocolate flavor. And typically, uh, for most beers, when we're talking about a chocolate flavor, be thinking about dark chocolate rather than milk chocolate. So dark chocolate flavors. The bitterness is going to be restrained because again, we're really letting that fruitiness and that sweetness shine. So the bitterness is going to be there to balance out, to, you know, to provide balance to some of that, but not, um, it's going to still be a very malt forward beer. Uh, hops are going to be none too little to low earthy or floral and now all I want to do is my mouth just wants to say earl or flory uh, so if I say that just know that I mean earthy or floral and my brain is just very tired today uh, moderate to high fruity esters medium low to no diacetyl a tropical stout again thinking about where does a tropical stout develop it developed in Jamaica it can have a dark rum like quality to it. Uh, just from the malts used, that was the flavor profile that was developed in the tropical climates. Mouthfeel, medium full to full body, moderate to moderately high carbonation. The warmth, since we're getting up to, you know, around 8% ABV, it can be, it, if it's there, it may be war warming, but it should never be hot. And then the creaminess is going to be smooth and creamy. So then the last one in this section is also a style that I really enjoy. Uh, it's, I think this one is one of the more difficult ones to kind of parse out from something like an Irish extra stout. This is going to be a very dark, moderately strong, fairly dry stout with prominent roast flavors. So with the foreign extra stout, the ABV is going to be up there. It's going to be around 8% or up to 8%. So really with the, and the Irish extra stat is included in last week's. Uh, so I will have a, a recording on that, but really the foreign extra stout is the Irish extra stout made just a little bit higher in ABV. So with an Irish extra stout, that ABV is going to be about 5.5 to 6.5%. So you can see with our foreign extra stout, this is going to start around 6.3 and go up to 8%. So it's really an Irish extra stout that's made just a little bit higher in ABV. It's going to have a little bit more character to it. So with our aroma, we would expect moderate to high roasted grain. This is when we're starting to see that there can be a little bit of that burnt quality. So it's going to have coffee, chocolate, and or lightly burnt notes. And this is really the first style we've seen where that little bit of burnt character is going to be appropriate. Uh, it may have molasses, licorice, dried fruit, and or vinous aromatics to it. Again, it may have, it doesn't have to. So you can kind of see like, I think I would be very hard pressed if I were doing a blind tasting between a tropical stout, a foreign extra stout, and an Irish extra stout to really pick out the difference. Um, I think, I feel like the foreign extra stout would be the most confusing to me, uh, but that's, it, it can be a lot of things, but just remember it's going to be that Irish extra stout kind of bumped up a little bit more. If we have any hops, it's going to be moderately low, herbal, earthy, or floral. So our traditional English hop flavors. Uh, the fermentation characteristics, low to medium fruitiness, diacetyl, low to none stronger versions. So when we're getting up to that 8% or so, they can have a subtle clean aroma of alcohol. And uh, again, when we're talking about 
alcohol aroma, alcohol warmth. Uh, I'm sure most of us have probably smelled some form of beer or alcohol that has that fusel, that really hot alcohol smell. So think about uh, smelling, I don't know, Everclear or something that has a very, very high ABV. When we're talking about like fusel and hot, that's the kind of alcohol we're talking about, as opposed to being able to smell something and tell that it's got alcohol in it, right? So it should be subtle, should be clean, it shouldn't be hot or fusel. The appearance, very deep brown to black, should be opaque. If it's not opaque, it should be clear. We're going to have good head retention and that head color is going to be tan to brown. And if you recall back from one of the very first weeks we were speaking when you're doing, particularly if you're doing a blind tasting, uh, that head color can oftentimes be a really good indication, particularly in darker beers or fruit beers, uh, that some sort of specialty malt has been added. So with something like all the roasted grains and malt that we're going to have in something like a foreign extra stout, that's going to be what's making that head color tan to brown. So that's just an additional tool to have in your toolbox. You know, when you see a uh, tan to brown head, or let's say you've got a beer that has a pink head, um, malts aren't going to cause that. Uh, something like fruit, like a raspberry added, will cause that head color to be a different color. So it's just a good visual indication that you may be about to drink a beer that has some sort of specialty malt added to it. So our flavor, moderate to high roasted grains, coffee, chocolate, or lightly burnt grain character, all of those are appropriate. Uh, bitterness, medium to high. So with an Irish extra stout and then a foreign extra stout, those are going to have that, like the bitterness level is going to be much more bumped up. So this is going to be more of a balance between the malt and the bitterness, the hot bitterness, not so much the hop flavor. Uh, if you have a hop flavor to it, it's going to be earthy, herbal, or floral. Um, I was about to say earthal. Um, so it's just going to get, it's just downhill from here when we're talking about uh, me trying to say earthy, herbal, and floral over and over again. Low to medium esters. Those esters are going to be fruity like the rest of our stouts. Diacetyl should be medium low to none. And again, our balance is going to be moderately dry. Uh, so I guess this is, as I'm you know, reading through this and thinking about it, I, the, that dryness in the balance and in the finish is going to be a good indication that this is going to be a foreign extra stout as opposed to something like a tropical stout that ha may have a little bit more of a sweeter finish. Our mouthfeel, the body is going to be medium full to full, the carbonation moderate to moderately high, and it's going to be smooth and creamy often, uh, but it doesn't have to be. So we're going to move on to American Porter and Stout. I'm going to grab a drink of water. And I did the thing again where I put the Q&A like right under my webcam. Uh, okay. So let's see. Uh, can the tropical stout be brewed with lager yeast? And Carlos, I do see your other two questions. I will follow back up with those at the end. Uh, when we're finished with the talking about the actual beer styles. So yes, a tropical stout can be brewed with lager yeast. Uh, it's not brewed with a lager yeast very often, um, but it can be. And um, let me pull that up there. Yes, so that is, tropical stout is one of those weird ones, kind of like a Baltic porter. Uh, well, Baltic porter is typically brewed with a lager yeast, but tropical stout, American wheat beer, and... There's oh um, Irish red beer. Those technically can all be brewed with lager yeast. So I will follow back up with the um, with your exam questions in just a few moments. All right. So let's go on to American porter and stout. So we're leaving England, uh, the British Isles, Great Britain. All of those places, we're leaving them behind. We're going to start talking about American styles now. So American Porter and Stout evolved from their English namesakes into American craft styles. So there's going to be, uh, you'll notice a lot of similarities, uh, but of course, you know, in with American craft, we're going to have our own spin on it. That spin is usually hops, uh, generally bigger, stronger, more roast forward and more hop centric. So, you know, Borrowing from England, making it a little bit bigger, 
that's how we do our a lot of our craft beer styles. So starting with American Porter, a substantial malty dark beer with a complex and flavorful dark malt character. And American Porter is one of my favorites. I would be, you know, hard pressed to, and I was just having this conversation the other day, really enunciate the differences between American Porter and American Stout. There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of gray area. Um, I know there's one commercial example of American Porter in particular that every time I have it, I call it an American Stout and I get very upset that it's an American Porter because I think it should be called an American Stout. Unfortunately, they didn't ask me. So uh, there is just know there's a lot of overlap between American Porter and American Stout. This is another great place where it's very helpful to have your hard copy of the guidelines because within the guidelines, they have those style comparisons that will explain a little bit better than I can some of the nuances between an American Porter and an American South. So looking at the score sheet, our aroma that we would expect, again, this is another malt forward beer, medium light to medium strong dark malt aroma, often with a lightly burnt character. So again, thinking back to we're taking the English styles and we're bumping everything up a little bit. So with the American styles, we're going to have that lightly burnt character is going to be appropriate. Um, and often, so often means that it's expected. If it doesn't have a lightly burnt character, it's not a flaw. Uh, may also show supportive malt characters such as grainy, bready, coffee-like, caramel, chocolate, or coffee. So American Porter has a very wide range of what it can be. And this is another style. I mean, all of the sales are great to grab a few commercial examples and taste side by side. American Porter is one of those styles where there really is quite a bit of latitude in what the style can be. So it's nice to grab a few commercial examples and taste them side by side to really understand all the different, you know, kind of like very small variations within the style. Hops are going to be low to high, resiny, earthy, or floral. So now that we're getting into American styles, we're going to be seeing a lot of resiny, um, a lot of citrus, a lot of dry hops. So something like an American porter may also be dry hop. And again, since it's American beer, it's going to have typically a higher focus on the hop character. So American porter is no exception to that. You can have a very hop forward American porter. The appearance is going to be medium brown to very dark brown, often with ruby or garnet like highlights, uh, which is also uh, a hallmark of some other styles. So, you know, Guinness, uh, Irish Stout, they say is actually not, not dark brown or black. It's actually a very, very dark ruby color. And so as we're getting into these darker beers, a lot of them will have those really nice looking ruby or garnet highlights. And I know I've mentioned this here before, um, darker beers, uh, not just darker beers, but when they have those really nice highlights in a competition, you know, it makes a very, a very nice presentation. And I will, I don't hesitate to put like, this is a good looking beer. Looking at this beer, it makes me very excited to try it. Uh, so the clarity, if it's not okay, just like our stouts and it should be clear, we'd expect moderately good head retention and that head is going to be tan and full. So with the flavor, the malt is going to be moderately strong. It usually features that lightly burnt character, uh, sometimes chocolate and coffee flavors. It, the sometimes chocolate and coffee flavors, you know, you can have a, a, an American porter with a little bit more caramel character to it. It really should have some kind of that darker roast character to it. It may have a sharp, uh, sharp character from the roasted grains, but it shouldn't be acrid, burnt, or harsh. So again, if you're drinking, you know, if you're sitting at your exam, or if you're at a competition and you're wondering if this seems a little acrid or burnt or harsh, it probably is. Um, it can have, may have that. It doesn't have to have that, and it shouldn't be high enough. This making me wonder if it's too high. Bitterness is medium to high. And our flavor, low to high, resiny, earth, earthy, or floral, um, dry hopped versions may have more of that resiny flavor. So when we're talking about resiny flavors, that is very much a hallmark of American hops. So that's something, you know, like a Simcoe, um, even a Cascade, Centennial, all of those have this kind of resin note to it. 
So fermentation characteristics, fruity esters are going to be moderate if they're there at all. So it can go anywhere from none up to moderate, usually a bit of grainy dark malt dryness in the finish, but overall the finish may, may the flavor may finish from dry to medium sweet. Our mouthfeel is going to be, if the body is going to be medium to medium full, the carbonation moderately low to moderately high. Strong versions may have a slight alcohol warmth. With an American Porter, you're really getting just over about 6% ABV. I think 6.3 is the upper limit. You wouldn't really expect to have that much alcohol warmth from a 6.3% beer, um, but if it's a stronger version, it might be there. It may have a slight astringency from dark malts, but, but that should not be strong. And again, astringency, I know for myself, is something that I'm not, that's not a strong suit of mine. Um, but if you're tasting it and you're wondering if it's too astringent, it probably is. So next we have American Stout. This is a fairly strong, highly roasted, bitter, hoppy, dark stout. So this is, um, sadly, you don't see a lot of American Stouts anymore. And I really love seeing just a nice, American stout that's that mid-range IBV or IBV, ABV, five to seven percent. You know, it's very drinkable and it doesn't have um, a bunch of adjuncts in it. It's just a nice roasty stout. Uh, you don't see those very often, and I wish that you did. With the aroma, we would expect moderate to strong roasted malts, often having a roasted coffee or dark chocolate quality. So here's where we're starting to see specifically that roasted coffee flavor being called out rather than the coffee flavor. So we're starting to get a little bit more into a little bit higher in those Maillard products, right? We would expect the coffee flavor, if you tasted it, this is roasted, roasted coffee, it's a little bit darker. It's been kilned a little bit longer to create those higher Maillard flavors. Burnt or chocolate aroma is acceptable at low levels. Our hops are going to be very low to medium, often citrusy or resiny. Again, citrus and resin are hallmarks of most American hops. Esters, none to medium. If they're there, they're going to be lightly fruity. Light alcohol derived aromatics are optional. Again, you know, a 6.3% beer, I wouldn't expect to see that much alcohol warmth or alcohol presence in it. Uh, the color is generally going to be jet black. Some may appear to be very dark brown. This is going to be usually opaque. We're going to have that persistent and large light tan to light brown head. Again, that head color is giving us an indication when we look at it that there's some kind of roasted malt in it, or I, it's more appropriate to say roasted grain. So with our flavor, moderate to very high roasted malt, often tasting of coffee, roasted coffee beans, dark or bittersweet chocolate. Um, so again, we're starting to see a few more layers in what those roasted flavors are going to taste like in the beer. Uh, it may have the flavor of slightly burnt coffee grounds, but should not be prominent. Low to medium malt sweetness, often with rich chocolate or caramel flavors. So we'll talk about Imperial Stout in a moment. Um, Imperial Stout can be a lot of things. American Stout, should not be an should not be an imperial stout. So you can have some of that rich chocolate, rich caramel flavor. You can have a little bit of that burnt character, but really the focus is going to be on that roasted malt character. So that you know the darker coffee flavors, the darker bittersweet chocolate flavors. Bitterness medium to high, hop flavor low to high, generally citrusy or resiny. So those classic American hop flavors, none to low esters. Our finish can be medium to dry, uh, occasionally with a lightly burnt quality. So if your, your flavor is giving you that lightly burnt quality, you would also expect to have that in the finish as that's the kind of flavor um, that really lingers on your palate. Alcohol flavors can be present up to medium levels, but it should be smooth. So again, with something like an American Stout, the highest that it should be is around 7% ABV. Uh, that's not, I really wouldn't expect to get that much alcohol warmth or alcohol presence from a, you know, from a 7% beer, um, but it can be there. So if you have one and you get that at a low level, it's fine. Um, or I guess up to medium levels. 
I don't know. I would, I, I would have to actually taste a 7% beer with a medium level of alcohol um, to, to know if that's a thing that exists or not. Uh, mouthful, mouthfeel, the body is going to be medium to full, carbonation, medium high to high, the warmth, light to moderately strong, but should be smooth and not excessively hot. Uh, an American style can be somewhat creamy, especially if it has a small, a small amount of oats used. It doesn't have to be creamy. Uh, and it can also have that bit of roast derived astringency, but again, should not be excessive. And depending on that proportion of roast and malts that are going to be used is, uh, is going to be the, one of the main drivers of where that astringency level is. Uh, but you shouldn't, again, if you find yourself wondering if it's too astringent, it's going to be too astringent. So then the last one we have in this section is imperial stout. So imperial stout is, you know, a stout turned up to 11. So it's intensely flavored, big, dark ale with a wide range of flavor balances and regional interpretations. So an important thing to note about Imperial Stout, and this is another fun sensory side-by-side -side to do, um, Imperial Stout is not necessarily just in uh, an American craft you know, version of the style. So you can also get really great English Imperial Stouts. It makes a very good side-by-side. Uh, Samuel Smith Imperial Stout, one of our commercial examples listed there, is fairly widely available. If you see that and you're able to find something like an Old Rasputin, an American Craft Imperial Stout, that makes a great side-by-side. -side. That's also a really good way if you're wanting to learn the differences between different yeast profiles. Something like a Samuel Smith has a very characteristic, I mean, Samuel Smith is you know, an, an OG English brewery. So it has a very characteristic English yeast profile where something like North Coast Old Rasputin has a very characteristic American yeast profile. And uh, that's just a really, it's a really great side-by-side, -side, not only to see the range available for Imperial Stout, but also to really taste those differences between a traditional English yeast profile and a traditional American yeast profile. So with our Imperial Stout, the aroma, light to moderately strong, coffee, dark chocolate, slightly burnt. Um, it can be light to moderately strong. It, it can have slight specialty malt to it. That's going to be um, specialty malt. I would also include something like oats in there, but specialty malt would be some kind of like maybe a caramel malt in there, um, something beyond roasted malt. Um, and usually that's there because if you had a beer that had just a ton of roasted malt in it is really not going to taste very good, right? It's going to be very astringent and very overpowering. Uh, our hop character is going to be very low to quite aggressive. If we're talking about an American Imperial Stout version, the hop character is probably going to lean more towards that very aggressive and it, contain, it can't contain any hop variety. Generally, if you have an English version of an Imperial Stout, it's likely going to have traditional English hops in it. Whereas if it's an American version, it's likely going to have American hops in it. Uh, so when it's, it can contain any hop variety, yes, that's technically true. Uh, you likely wouldn't end up with a very good flavor profile if you use like a New Zealand, very tropical fruit, um, kind of dank caddy hop in it the same way if you wanted to use something like a noble hop, like a saws hop, that's very delicate and has a very delicate flavor, that's really going to get lost in that imperial stout. Uh, so yes, it can, contain any, it can contain any hop variety. Typically it's going to, the hop variety will match whatever region it was brewed in. So our esters, low to moderately strong. This is where we're starting to get more of that dark fruit uh, complexity. So plums, raisins, figs, prunes, um, you know, any really kind of dark fruits. A lot of times with imperial stouts, particularly English stouts, I get more of a dark cherry or even more of a, um, the overall impression sort of starts to lean towards kind of like a chocolate orange uh, because of course the chocolate malt in it, uh, but then that those darker kind of orange flavors from the uh, British ale yeast esters. So other aromatics, alcohol character may be present, but it shouldn't be sharp, hot, or solventy. 
if it's an aged version, it might it may have a slight vinous or port like quality, but it shouldn't be sour. So we're not edging into kind of an old ale sort of category where it, we're staying, you know, firmly within aged beer. Uh, so we would expect it to have a little bit more of those oxidative flavors such as port or that vinous flavor. So our appearance, very dark reddish brown to jet black. It's going to be opaque. Uh, the head retention, low to moderate and the head color, deep tan to dark brown. And one other thing, since it's going to be higher in ABV, so this is one of our beer styles that can have up to a 12% ABV. When you swirl the glass, you may see those visible legs on the inside, which is also another good visual indication that you may have a beer that's higher in ABV as you're doing that appearance assessment. So with an imperial stout, the malt again is going to be the star of the show, rich, deep, complex, quite intense, moderately to aggressively high malt character. You can have, this is where we're starting to see the bittersweet or unsweetened chocolate, cocoa, strong coffee. Uh, you will have more of the burnt characters are going to be appropriate. So burnt grain, burnt currant, tarry characters, the background of the malt can be um, anywhere from being supportive. So it's there all the way to being barley wine like. So barley wine is going to have more of that like caramel sort of flavor to it. Uh, so it may optionally show some supporting caramel bready or toasty flavors, but really that those roasted characters are going to be what's driving the flavor profile of an imperial stout. The bitterness is going to be medium to aggressively high. Again, if we're talking about an American imperial stout, that's where that bitterness is going to start getting to the aggressively high level. Uh, the hop flavor can be medium low to high. It can be any flavor. Again, generally, you know, there's no beer style police, but generally if you're making an English interpretation of an imperial stout, it's going to have traditional English hops in it. If you're making an American interpretation, it will have traditional American hops. You can put any hop you would like into an imperial stout. Uh, I guess technically you can put any hop you would like into any beer. No beer style police are going to show up. Uh, but whether or not the, the hop flavor is going to go well with that roasted malt is going to be a different story. So fermentation characteristics. Also, since we're getting higher into the ale ABV category, uh, those fruity esters can be low to quite intense. Generally, with something like an English, more of an English leaning imperial stout, that's when you would expect to see a little bit more of those fruity esters because English ale yeast is known for its fruity esters, whereas American ale yeast generally is known for being very clean. Um, it can take on that dark fruit character, so raisins, plums, or prunes. The finished aftertaste, so this can vary from relatively dry to moderately sweet, usually with some lingering roastiness, hot bitterness, and warming character, because again, generally an imperial stout is going to start around the 8.0% ABV range, and it can go up to about 12% ABV. So this is one of those areas where, yes, you would expect to have some kind of alcohol character, alcohol warmth. Uh, the balance and intensity of the flavors can be affected by aging. So as, as the beer ages over time, you may have some more of those aged, vinous, port-like, sherry qualities developing. You would also expect some of your flavors, like if you had a very high hot flavor, um, you would expect that to decline over time. So more of the malt, more of those aged qualities would come forward. For the mouthfeel, full to very full and chewy. Uh, with something like an imperial stout, that's where you're going to start to get into more of that um, thicker viscosity uh, kind of motor oil category, uh, low to moderate carbonation, depending on the age and the condition, smooth, gentle alcohol should be present and noticeable, but it should not be a primary characteristic. Um, when I read that, I interpret that to mean um, you are going to notice your malt profile, your flavor profile, and then, oh yeah, I can, I can taste the alcohol there rather than, you know, taking a, a drink and your mouth being warm and you saying, whoa, that's a boozy beer. Uh, so it shouldn't be a primary characteristic. And then we would expect that velvety luscious texture for, from the Imperial Stout. Um, so again, before we go into the American Amber and Brown Beer category, um, 
remember with an imperial stout, most of us in the States are used to, you know, American craft imperial stout. Definitely seek out a, a, an English style imperial stout if you can do a side by side of the two to really understand the nuances between the, the characters. Uh, because imperial stout is, again, it's one of those categories that can be very wide. Okay. All right. So pausing there to get a drink of water. And we'll wrap up with these last three beers and then answer any questions that you all have. So amber and brown American beer, uh, modern American amber and brown warm fermented beers, standard strength that can be balanced to bitter. So the first one we'll talk about is American amber ale. And this one um, I always kind of joke about, but it's uh, an amber, hoppy, moderate strength American craft beer with a caramel malty flavor. I shouldn't say that I joke about it, but um, American amber ale, I know I've talked about the, you know, the flexibility within some different styles tonight, but American amber ale can be anything. If you read through the guidelines, it can be anywhere from toasty and nutty to very caramel forward and rich. Uh, so it can be very approachable. I find a lot of times with home brewers, that's one of the very first styles they start brewing. And, uh, you know, I think that's great because again, there's a ton of room for interpretation with an American amber ale, which we'll talk about more, uh, but it also lends itself really well to, you know, adding fruit, adding smoke, adding all sorts of things to it because that base sale can vary so widely that you can really dial it in to whatever flavor profile you're looking for. And it's uh, American Amber Ale. You really don't see it very often anymore, just an American Amber Ale. Uh, and you may also sometimes see it as a red ale. Generally, a red ale and an American Amber Ale are interchangeable. We're talking about the same thing. Um, it's not a, you know, next week, I believe next week is when we'll start talking about the IPA. So it's not a red IPA. It's not a rye IPA. Um, it's definitely ale and it will it can be more, it can have more of a hot presence, but generally it's going to be a little bit more of a malt showcase, but it doesn't have to be. But um, American Amber Ales are very much the, you know, one of the classic American crafts, like, uh, you know, I'm sure my dad ordered one in a microbrewery in like 1998. Uh, so American Amber Ales are kind of quaint. You don't see them very often, but uh, they can be a lot of things. So the malt character, moderately low to moderately high, usually with a moderate caramel character. The hops, low to moderate. Citrus hop character is common, but it's not required. So the citrus hop character, of course, being that very classic American hop profile. Uh, so characteristics typical of American New World hop varieties. We've got a whole list here, really, you know, any kind of hop flavor is going to be appropriate in an American Amber Ale, citrus, floral, pine, resin, spicy, tropical fruit, stone fruit, berry, melon. Um, again, it's a good canvas to try out hop profiles, malt profiles. It can be a lot of things. Esters can be none to moderate. The color is going to be amber to coppery brown, makes sense. Generally quite clear, although if we have a dry hop version, it can be slightly hazy. Uh, good head retention, off-white, moderately large head. Uh, so flavors, pretty much the same as the aroma, moderate to strong. It can show an initial malty sweetness followed by a moderate caramel flavor. Uh, that's what it usually shows. It doesn't have to show that. Um, I left the bitterness off on here, so I will get that updated, but bitterness has the similar range of being able to be uh, moderately low to moderately high. Uh, flavor is going to be moderate to high. Again, citrus flavor is common. It's not required. We have this whole list of hops that you can use in an American Amber Ale and still have it properly called an American Amber Ale. Fruity esters can be moderate to none, and the malt and hop bitterness are usually balanced and mutually supportive, but can vary either way. Caramel sweetness and hop flavor or bitterness can linger somewhat into the medium to full finish. So you can tell as we're talking through this, you know, with the flavor, with the aroma, 
it can be a lot of things. American Amber Ale is a very flexible style. It also makes it an interesting one to judge because again, you have all of these interpretations. Uh, so getting the opportunity to really taste that range, um, there's, there's just a lot of variety within the style. The body is going to be medium to medium full, carbonation medium to high. Strong versions may have a slight alcohol warmth. Again, we're talking about a beer at its upper limits that should be at about low 6.3 or so ABV. I really wouldn't expect to see much alcohol warmth. Uh, and then overall smooth finish without astringency. Something like an American Amber Ale, you're really, you technically you could have a very small amount of roasted grain, but without, generally you won't see that. And without that roasted grain, you're not going to get very much astringency. So then next we have California Common. This again is, this is one of my favorite styles as well. And a, another one that you don't see very often. So it's a lightly fruity beer with a firm grainy maltiness, interesting toasty and caramel flavors and showcasing rustic traditional American hop characteristics. So the, you'll see this rustic American hop characteristics repeated a lot throughout this description. Generally with a California common, what we're talking about is Northern Brewer hops. That's going to be the most traditional. And so that's what's giving us that rustic traditional American hop characteristic. So with California common, it's, a, it's an interesting story. As you can see on the, uh, the commercial standard or commercial examples that Anchor Steam is the first one listed. And uh, then you'll see that the other, you know, none of the other beers have steam in their name. And that's because way back in the day, Anchor Brewing out of California actually uh, has a or trademark on the word steam. So nobody can call a steam beer a steam beer, although Anchor wasn't the first brewery to brew a steam beer, they were the first to lay legal claim to it. So that's why this style is known as California Common. Anchor Brewing can call it a steam beer. Everybody else has to call it a California Common. And they do actually like pretty aggressively protect that copyright around their beer. So with a California Common, you may remember a few weeks ago, we talked about alt beer. And this is another, I'm giving you guys lots of good side-by-sides to do this week, uh, but California Common and Alt Beer are a magnificent side-by-side -side to do because California Common is a lager, but it's fermented at ale temperatures. So it's going to be fermented a little bit warmer. That's going to give it, you'll see on the esters, that light fruitiness is acceptable for a California Common. You'll recall when we talked about other, about lagers, you know, a hallmark of a lager is going to be that very crisp, clean fermentation character, um, in part because it's fermented at such a low temperature, it doesn't develop esters the same way that an ale yeast, which is fermented at higher temperatures, will develop those esters. But since we're taking a lager yeast and we're fermenting at higher temperatures, you get some fruitiness from that. So a California Common is a lager that's fermented at ale temperatures, an alt beer is an ale that's fermented at lager temperatures. They're very, very similar. And um, definitely do it as a side-by-side -side just to kind of learn those differences. Uh, but they are, they're very similar. So that's not a, that's not a beginner move. If this is the first time that you're setting down to do a side-by-side -side of beer, uh, maybe don't start with this one, but if you've been doing a few, go ahead and do this one. It's just a very interesting experience um, and also a good way to get that feel for traditional German ingredients in a beer and traditional American ingredients in a beer. Uh, so that particularly with the hops and with the malt, you get those different profiles. Um, and, you know, I once met a home brewer who said that alt beer was his favorite beer style and man, did he hate California Common. And I think that's one of the weirdest things that anybody has ever said to me about their likes and dislikes for beers, because the beer styles themselves, and you'll see if you taste these side by side, um, they're very, very similar. So it's very, it's, it was always just weird. It's kind of like, man, I really like ketchup, but I really hate catsup kind of thing. Um, so anyway, with the California Common, when we're talking about the aroma, that's going to be low to moderate caramel or toasty. 
typically showcases rustic American hops in moderate to high strength. So again, generally for a California common, Northern brewer hops is going to be the most uh, traditional. That doesn't mean that you can't use a different kind of hop in a California common, but that rustic American hop flavor is one of the hallmarks of a California common. And the light fruitiness is acceptable from that lager yeast fermented at ale temperatures. The color is going to be medium amber to light copper. Generally it's going to be clear and we're going to have an off-white head with good retention. The flavor is going to be very similar, usually toasty and caramelly. You should not have any kind of roasted flavor in a, in a I almost said a caramel common, in a California common. Uh, pronounced bitterness, low to moderately high hop flavor, often showcasing rustic traditional American hops with woody, rustic, and minty flavors. And that minty flavor is something that is very unique to a Northern Brewer hop. So if you were wondering what a kind of a minty flavor in a hop is going to taste like, grab an Anchor Steam, grab a California Common, and get that it really is a showcase of Northern Brewer hops. You don't see a lot of like Northern Brewer hops don't really get um, a showcase or a spotlight very often. California Common does a very nice job of highlighting kind of this unsung hop of the American craft world. Fermentation characteristics, light fruity esters are acceptable, fairly dry and crisp with a lingering hop bitterness and a firm grainy malt flavor. The body is going to be medium, carbonation is going to be medium to high. So then the last one we have for tonight is American Brown Ale. This is a malty but hoppy beer frequently with chocolate and caramel flavors. So another side-by-side -side for you, sit down with an American Porter and American Brown Ale um, and try those side-by-side. -side. If you're feeling really adventurous, put an American Stout in there as well. And you'll get very much the range if you're going American Brown Ale, American Porter, American Stout, uh, you know, one that's going to have more of the caramel chocolate flavors, one that's going to be kind of in between, maybe leaning a little bit more roasty, and then something like an American Stout, which is going to be very roast focused. So with American Brown Ale, moderate malty sweet to malty rich, chocolate, caramel, nutty, and or toasty qualities. Generally, you will expect to find the chocolate and the caramel flavor in an American brown ale. And also American brown ale, British brown ale, that's another great side-by-side -side to do just to learn uh, most American brown ales, uh, particularly if you're getting a commercial example. This is where it's important to get commercial examples of, um, of the two different beer styles because when you have the commercial example, you're going to have that very characteristic American yeast character, characteristic American hops, American malt, you'll get the same thing with an English brown ale and be able to taste them side by side to really help you learn those differences between something like an, an English beer and an American beer. So our hops are going to be low to moderate, any hop variety that complements the malt. And again, that, that is harder to do with American, American styles. It's not harder to do, but you know, generally when we think of something like an American craft beer, we're thinking about like hops really in your face. They're going to be citrusy, dank. Uh, those might not always be the best match for an American brown ale. So, you, you know, you have to really balance those flavors a little bit more so in something like an American brown ale than you do in something like an American IPA. Some interpretations may feature a stronger hop aroma, um, an American or new world hop aroma, and or a fresh dry hopped aroma. It can have each one of those. It doesn't have to have any of those. It can have all three of those. The most important thing is that the hop variety complements the malt flavor. Esters moderate to very low. Uh, color is going to be light to very dark brown. We're going to have nice clarity to it. Low to moderate head retention, off white to tan head. The flavor we're going to have moderate or medium to moderately high, malty sweet or malty rich chocolate, caramel, nutty, and or toasty malt complexity. Bitterness, medium to medium high. Again, we're talking about an American style. So we always have to kind of like push that bitterness up a little bit, but the, you know, the bitterness can be anywhere from balancing that malt flavor to, you know, maybe pushing the bitterness just a little bit past just that balancing stage. Flavor of our hops is going to be light to moderate 
any hop variety that complements the malt. It needs to complement the malt. You don't want an orange juice toothpaste situation uh, between your hops and your malt, because again, this is a very malt forward beer. So really, um, you know, that integrity of the malt character is going to be the most important thing for an American brown ale. Very low to moderate fruity esters. Your finish is going to be medium to medium dry, medium to medium full body, moderate to moderately high carbonation, and more bitter versions may have more of a resiny impression. Again, that's more bitter versions, assuming that you're using more of a, a resin forward American hop. So that is the end of my slides I have for you all. And then let's go to our Q and A. And then if anybody has any other questions to wrap up? I have a couple here from Carlos that are more of the like a general tasting question. So if anybody has any sales specific questions or any questions at all, feel free to pop those into the Q&A while we go over these. So um, on the exam, we have 15 minutes to judge a beer. Would the same rules apply to a BJCP sanctioned competition? Will we have 15 minutes to judge a beer? This is a great question. Um, the, the short answer is, no, uh, technically you will have as much time as you need to judge a beer, depending on who your judge partner is, um, will depend on what that time looks like. Generally in a competition, they should let you know about how much time they want you to spend on a beer. Really uh, 15 minutes is going to be at the, the upper end of what you should be spending when you're filling out a score sheet in a competition. Um, generally about 10 minutes is going to be the best practice. Uh, if, again, it depends on the competition, it depends on your judge. If I'm judging with a brand new judge, I will let them take, you know, as I won't say as much time as they need, but I will definitely give them more leeway because it's more important that you're filling out the score sheet well, uh, particularly in something like a competition, people are paying money to get your feedback, to hear what you have to say. And it's important to me as a judge to make sure that you as a judge have that opportunity to provide as much feedback as you can. Of course, that's also helping you become a better beer judge. But yeah, generally you're not going to have a, a you know a time limit. Um, when I was at national uh, the national homebrew competition uh, a couple of months ago judging, we had we would have a flight of you know anywhere from like nine to twelve beers, and we had an hour to fill out score sheets for them. And they actually came up with egg timers and set them on the table, um, and expected you to be finished within that time frame. You won't have to do anything like that. Um, that's generally you know where they put those those kinds of time frames on judges who can work very quickly. Um, don't feel rushed when you're filling out a score sheet, but I would say rule of um, I would say 15 minutes is going to be more towards the upper end of what you should be spending. Um, but that's always a conversation when you sit down at a competition to have with your judging partner. It's also going to depend on how many beers you have in that flight and how many flights the competition has, um, you know, as a whole, because we also want to keep things moving to make sure everything gets finished in a timely way. Uh, okay, so. Every week I send emails with this information, but could I send the list of must know styles of beer or the ones that get tested most frequently in the BJCP judging exam and the certified Cicerone tasting exam? Yes, I can do that. And I do, um, sometimes I forget in the weekly emails to highlight the beer styles that are most frequently tested on the, uh, in the members area on the events calendar for each week. I do have them bolded in there, but I'm happy to compile those all into one list with the understanding that uh, they're the ones that are most frequently tested. It doesn't mean that, or it doesn't guarantee that those will be the ones that you're tested on. But generally, you know, you will expect to see um, some of the, some of the sales are more common than others, particularly when it comes to something like the certified Cicerone exam, where they are using common commercial examples. Um, and when I say common, it's, you know, I'm, I'm talking about an American IPA or a Flanders red ale or an American wheat, something like that that's going to be uh, 
it's going to be within the realm of reason that you will have had that before. With the BJCP beer judging exam, since most of those beers should be coming from home brewers, you may get some more of the more esoteric styles, but you're not going to get, um, you know, you're not going to get like a Grzegitski or um, a London Brown Ale, like really anything like that. Uh, so yes, that is a very long way of saying, yes, I can compile a list of the ones that are most frequently tested or that you're more likely to see. Um, okay, so I don't see any other questions. If you have some, I can vamp for just a couple of minutes to make sure that you can see, uh, you, you have time to put them in. And uh, as I said, these, this, these slides, the notes versions are already available. The slides version and the video will be up probably Wednesday or Thursday. And next week, I believe, is when we're moving into the IPA categories. If not then, then the week after that. Um, please go ahead, and I think I don't think I've encouraged you all to do this in a while, but uh, go to the BJCP website, see what competitions you might have coming up that are near you, and sign up to judge for one of them. I was able to judge with a couple of new judges this past weekend, and um, it was great. And I. You know, uh, I think people tend to think they're not ready. We're in week 10 now of this beer judge training. I'm telling you that you're ready. You're probably far more prepared than I ever was when I went to sit down at a competition and judge. So please go to the BJCP website, see if there's any competitions coming up near you and don't even think about it. Just one, two, three, email the exam or email the competition administrator and see if they have room for judges uh, or even stewards. And then um, with that, I will wrap it up. I don't see any other questions coming through. You all know how to reach me. You can reach me through the website. You can email me um, and I will try to get back to you within a couple of days. So thank you everyone. Thank you again for your understanding last week of me not being able to make our session. I will make it up to you. And in the meantime, have a great week. Happy studying. I gave you a lot of really fun homework to do this